Hi, I'm Ginger Williams, and welcome to Making the Move. I want to invite you today to uh, spend a few minutes in the Word of God. You know, when we study the Word, we find out a lot of times that we're not living like we're supposed to, even as born-again believers. So many times we, we look at the Word of God and we think, well, you know, the Bible tells us to do certain things, but we don't do it. Well, this program is to encourage you to grow up in the Lord. It's a program that will hopefully help you to understand that there's times in our process in this walk with God that we're going to run into some problems. You know, um, I want to call this today, don't be perplexed in the process. You know, 2 Corinthians 5.17 tells us very plainly that we're new creations in Christ Jesus. And even as a new creation, even as a mature Christian, there are times when we run into situations that are very, very hard. And we have to know the Word of God in order to be able to handle those things. And so come with me to 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 11, and let's look and see what the Apostle Paul says. 2 Corinthians 4, 8 through 11. Paul's talking to the church here, and he says, We're hard-pressed on every side, yet not crushed. We're perplexed, but not in despair. Persecuted, but not forsaken. Struck down, but not destroyed. Always carrying about in the body the dying of the Lord Jesus, that the life of Jesus also may be manifested in our body. For we who live are always delivered to death for Jesus' sake, that the life of Jesus may be manifested in our mortal flesh. Perplexed. Have you ever been perplexed? You know, some of us may not even know what the word perplexed means. But perplexed means to have no way out. You feel like that you're at a loss, that you're standing in doubt. You know, a person that's perplexed, according to Webster's uh, definition, says to cause to be puzzled or bewildered over what is not understood or certain, to make complicated, to be confused. Perplexed can also mean to be involved or entangled. Have you ever been perplexed? I sure have. You know, a lot of times when we think about our Christian walk and we think, well, I thought this walk was supposed to be easy with the Lord. It's funny, when I first came back to the Lord, I mean, I thought I was going to just get born again and go on my merry way and kind of be like angels floating on clouds and the glory song was going to be playing all the time and everything was going to be roses. But that's not quite what I've experienced. And I don't imagine that you have either. Sometimes I've been perplexed. Paul, the apostle, a man of God, somebody that wrote two-thirds of the New Testament. Paul said, hey, I'm hard-pressed. I'm perplexed. You know, Paul faced a lot of trial, a lot of tribulation. Paul was one of those that, you know, they left him for dead one day. Beat him up, left him for dead. Paul spent a lot of time in prison. A lot of time in prison. And then there came a time when Paul was on a ship doing what he felt like that the Lord had told him to do, going where he was supposed to be going, and what happens? He gets on a shipwreck. He's involved in this shipwreck. Why? He was being obedient to the Lord. He was doing what God called him to do. Have you ever felt that way? Have you ever felt like, you know, Lord, I mean, where are these trials and tribulations coming from? I mean, I'm doing everything I know to do. I'm reading the Word. I'm praying, I'm fasting, I'm going to church, I'm being as obedient to the Lord as I know how to do. But man, it seems like that every time I turn around, something's happening. Well, just like Paul, we're called to have to go through trials and tribulations. We may never see the inside of a prison cell, but like Paul, many of us have been imprisoned to our past through emotional issues, problems, things that have kept us bound. We may never be called to be a martyr like many in the body of Christ are today. We may never be called to be a martyr. But Scripture tells us that we have to die to ourself daily. We have got to crucify our flesh, guys. There comes a time in our life when we have to do these things. Paul was shipwrecked. I've never been in a shipwreck. I hope you haven't. But you know what? circumstances in life can cause us to feel like that we're shipwrecked. Many times we lose our job or maybe a marriage 
breaks up and, and we go through a divorce that maybe we didn't even want. Lack of education. You know, sometimes people don't have the opportunity to go to, to a, a, a place of higher learning, a college or a university. And so when they go out looking for a job, they're limited to what they can do. Shipwreck. Have you ever been going along just great and doing things and paying your bill and buying your house and your vehicles and everything's just great and then all of a sudden you lose your job? You're shipwrecked. You can't pay your bills. And then the next thing you know, you're filing for bankruptcy. Folks, this happens. It happens in relationships every day. I know people right now that family members don't get along. You got moms and children fussing and fighting with each other. Dads and sons that can't get along. You've got relationships between boyfriends and girlfriends, husbands and wives, even some very best friends. And all of a sudden we experience a shipwreck. Things that we thought would never happen, they happened. And yet we're trying to live right before the Lord. Now I'm not talking about people that are living out in the world. I'm talking about Christians. I'm talking about people that know the Lord Jesus Christ. They've been born again. They have the Spirit of God living inside of them. But they're perplexed. They don't understand what's going on in their life. A lot of times we see this in Scripture. One of the people that I think was perplexed was David. You know, we read a lot about David. David had, there were lots of seasons in David's life. But one of the times when David was running from King Saul, you know, Saul hated David. Everybody thought David was the man. Saul hated him. And so he was trying, David was trying to get away from Saul. He came to a place to hide, and he didn't want anybody to know who he was. And so Scripture says, over in 2 Samuel 22, says David began to act crazy. He began to act like a crazy person. He, he began to foam at his mouth. He let spittle run down his cheek. You know, he was acting crazy so that nobody would know who he was. And then Scripture tells us that he winds up over in a cave called Adullam with 400 guys. Now, I can't imagine how that was, but the sad part about it was is that all these men, they were in distress. They were in debt. Scripture says that they were discontented. They were dissatisfied. They were restless. Oh, my goodness, can you imagine? When David went into this cave, how perplexed he must have been. He may have cried out to the Lord, What in the world is going on? I don't understand. I'm bewildered, Lord. I'm confused, Lord. I don't understand. Why in the world did you send me down here to a cave and all these guys are here? Well, read on a little, little further. Go over to the second chapter or the second book of Samuel in chapter 23. And then David's got some guys called mighty men. These mighty men. You know, these guys were David's bodyguard. These were the ones that were all around him, the elite, the royal group. It's kind of like today's secret service. They were all around David. Now, how in the world did they go from a bunch of guys that were in a cave that were perplexed and distressed and anxious and just flat worn out, fussing and griping and complaining about every little thing? How in the world did they go from that to mighty men, to people that were in an elite group? You know, they became an overcomer. You and I do the same thing, but it takes a process. They had to go through a process. David went through a process. Every person in Scripture goes through a process. It's a process sometimes that we think, Lord, I don't think I'm ever going to get through this. I don't understand, Lord. I've done everything that you call me to do, and yet nothing seems to be working out. Well, don't get perplexed in your process. Let's go over to Luke 24, 1 through 8. I love the Word of God. You know, there's so many examples in God's Word to show us how we are to respond. You know, Timothy says that all Scripture is given by inspiration of God, by the Holy Spirit, and that we can learn, we can be corrected, we can learn how to live and, and act and be instructed in righteousness. And so all of the Scripture that the Lord has provided for us gives us answers, gives us ways to live our life and to be able to walk through this process 
of life. In Luke 24, 1 through 8, it says, And now on the first day of the week, very early in the morning, they and certain other women with them came to the tomb, bringing the spices which they had prepared. But they found the stone rolled away from the tomb. And then they went in, and they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. And they were afraid, and they bowed their faces to the earth, and they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He's not here. He's risen. Remember how he spoke to you when he was still in Galilee, saying, The Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified, and the third day rise again. And they remembered his words. See, they went over to the tomb, and they were getting ready to go and prepare Jesus' body. And when they got there, they found that the stone had been rolled away. Back in those days, they buried people up like up in caves. And there was a big opening, and so there was a big stone that was pushed up in front of there. But when the ladies got there, the stone was gone. You've got to know they were perplexed. You've got to know that they were bewildered. They were wondering what in the world has taken place. The Bible says they were greatly perplexed. They knew that Jesus had died on the cross. They knew that he had been taken to this grave. But yet he wasn't there. So they were confused. They were bewildered as to what was going on. But then if you look, and it says in verse 7, or verse 6, it says, He's not here, He's risen. Remember how He spoke to you when He was still in Galilee? Saying the Son of Man must be delivered into the hands of sinful men and be crucified and the third day rise again. And they remembered His words. See, folks, if we'll remember what the Lord has told us, then in these times when we're bewildered, in these times when we don't understand what's going on, we do the very best that we can to be obedient to the Lord. And we follow the instruction of the Lord. And we follow the command of the Lord to the best of our ability. And yet, things don't seem to work out. Or the outcome is not what we thought. We have to remember, what did the Lord tell you? You know, many people will step out on a promise from the Lord. And they'll go about doing whatever God has asked them to do. And they'll get halfway through the process and then things fall apart. And they'll say, well, Lord, I thought you told me to do that. I thought you told me, God. I don't see a way out of this, Lord. I, I'm, I'm at a loss. I don't understand. He's saying, don't be perplexed. Remember what I told you. Remember the last word that was spoken. You know, I know someone that, that the Lord uh, impressed upon her to open a ministry. And she did. And she had that ministry for several years, and then the ministry closed. And she began to doubt herself. She began to become perplexed about why this didn't work out. And through the years, she said, Lord, was that really you? And you know, I believe it really was him. I believe that it was God telling her, I want you to do this in this season. Perhaps she was ahead of the timing of God, but she learned some valuable lessons. And the people that were in that ministry and involved with that ministry they grew. So we can't get perplexed in this process of our growth as Christians. You know, we start out as babes. We start out as little spiritual infants. And if we're not careful along the way, we'll allow the enemy to come in and to steal our process. He'll try to stop everything that God's called us to do. But you and I don't have to get upset about it. We don't have to get confused about it. We just have to trust God and say, Lord, you're going to complete that which concerns me. And so I'm going to do what you say. Let's look at 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. 2 Corinthians 4, 16 through 18. Scripture says, therefore, we do not lose heart. Even though our outward man is perishing, yet the inward man is being renewed day by day. For our light affliction, which is but for a moment, 
is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. While we don't look at the things which are seen, but at the things which are not seen, for the things which are seen are temporary, but the things which are not seen are eternal. You see, this process of living in godliness and holiness, it takes living after the flesh. I mean, I'm sorry, after the spirit and not after the flesh. We've got to come to a place to where we're filled with the spirit of God. We have to come to a place where we sell out to Jesus. Scripture says, don't lose heart. Even though this outward man is perishing. It says, the inward man is being renewed day by day. You know, we're a three-part being, guys. We are a spirit. We have a soul and we live in this body. Our body's our house. But the real us is inside. And every day that we renew our mind to God's word, we're getting stronger and stronger and stronger. I don't know about you, but my flesh was pretty strong. And it wasn't until I began to renew my mind to the word of God that my spirit man began to subdue my flesh man. Well, I had to do it every day. And then he says in verse 17, he says, For our light affliction, which is but for a moment is working for us a far more exceeding and eternal weight of glory. It's only for a moment that we go through these things. It's only for a moment in this process of life. Many of us will live 60, 70, 80, 90, 100 years if the Lord tarries, but we're always going to be in a process from the day we're born again until the time that we go home to be with the Lord or He comes to get us. We're going through a process, but we have to learn to live this process in godliness, in holiness. And we do it by being filled with the Spirit. Not walking after the flesh. Not losing heart along the way. Not getting perplexed and discouraged. We come to a place to where we sell out to Jesus. And we say, Lord, you know, this process may be hard, but boy, it's going to be worth it in the end. It's worth it to grow up in the Lord. It's worth it to mature in the Lord. You know why? Because a lot of times, people that have known you all your life, they see you one way before you renew your mind, before you're born again. And then they come along and they see you after you've been filled with the Spirit, after you've renewed your mind. And they begin to look at you and they say, man, God did something in their life. See, God gets the glory. You and I never get the glory for what, what happens in our life because we don't really do anything. All we do is walk in obedience to the Lord. He does the work. And so we want people to see the changes that have taken place in our life. We want people to see the glory of God on our life. But we have to be obedient to His Word. We have to take His Word. We have to read the Scriptures. We have to apply it. Again, just reading the Word or hearing the Word is not enough. I can sit and talk to you for 30, 45 minutes and you've heard the word and then you can jump up and go off and do just like you were doing before you watched the program, it's not going to really do you a lot of good. Now, the word of God doesn't return void. And at some point, that word is going to begin to work in your life. But you have to put the word to work. It's like a seed. The word of God is like a seed planted in soil. Is the soil of your heart good, Graham? Or is the soil of your heart hard? And you really don't like what I'm saying. <laughs> you know, there has to be a change. There's a process that's going on in our lives. Turn with me over to Luke 18. I love this little story. Luke 18. Luke 18, 1 through 8. This is called the parable of the persistent widow. And then he spoke a parable to them that men always ought to pray and not lose heart. Saying, there was in a certain city a judge who did not fear God nor regard man. Now there was a widow in that city, and she came to him saying, Get justice for me for my adversary. And he wouldn't for a while. But afterward he said within himself, Though I don't fear God nor regard man, yet because this widow troubles me, then I will avenge her, lest by her continual coming she weary me and then the lord said hear what the unjust judge said 
And, and shall God not avenge his own elect who cry out day and night to him, though he bears long with them? I tell you that he will avenge them speedily. Nevertheless, when the Son of Man comes, will he really find faith on the earth? You know, a lot of times you and I will call out to God and it's almost in a in a an unbelief. God, I know you can do this, but you know, maybe you will, maybe you won't. Well, Lord, maybe it's your will to heal me, but then maybe it's not. Or maybe God, you know, maybe those are some of those people that you've predestined and and, and they're not gonna go to heaven. Look, guys, read the word. The word of God is truth. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. And no man comes to the Father but by me. A lot of times we look into the word of God and we don't use our faith. We're not persistent. This little lady went to a judge and she said, get justice for me from my adversary. You know, that's what you and I have to do. We've got to go to the Lord and we've got to knock and say, Lord, get justice for me. The enemy's coming against me. The enemy's coming against my family, against my children. Get justice for me, Lord. And you know, a lot of people say, well, you know, you just pray it one time and that's it. No, I don't think so. Jesus said, keep on asking. Keep on knocking. Keep on seeking him. This lady kept coming back. He said, because of her continual coming, she was persistent. She didn't get perplexed in this process of going to the judge. She didn't say, oh, I went to him one time and he didn't do anything, and so I'm just not going to go again. I don't know about you guys, but I tell you what, I'm going to go to the Lord over and over and over and over on behalf of my health, in behalf of my finances, on behalf of my family, on behalf of my children, on behalf of my ministry, on behalf of my friends. I'm not going to get perplexed in this process of Christianity because the benefit is too great. Other people will see what God has done in our lives when we're persistent. God is looking for a people that will remain in faith. He's looking for somebody, regardless of the circumstances. He's looking for somebody to be persistent, not perplexed. He's looking for somebody. You know, in the days that we live, guys, it's very evident. All you got to do is turn on the news. Look at YouTube. My goodness, at all the things that are being spoken about the month of September. And we're in it. You know, there's a great shaking coming. Scripture talks about this in Hebrews. There's a shaking coming to our economy. There's a shaking coming to politics. There's a shaking that has already come in society. There's a shaking that's coming in relationships, in religion. Persecution is on the rise. We're beginning to see things that we've never seen before. We're beginning to experience things. There's many, many words that are being spoken about earthquakes that are coming, volcanoes that are coming weather patterns that are changing, many things that can cause us to be perplexed, to be confused, to be worried. But if we stand on the Word of God, we're going to know what to do. The Bible tells us very plainly in Hebrews, it says from the time of John the Baptist until now, the kingdom of God progresses through violence. There's going to be violence in the kingdom of God. They've experienced that from many years back, and we're still experiencing today. Light is going to come against darkness, more so than we've ever seen it. Our flesh is going to rise up against our spirit, more so than we've ever had it. Because the enemy's on the loose. He knows that his time is short. You know, John says in 1633, he says, there's going to be, Jesus was speaking this, he said, there will be trials and tribulations in this world. He said, but be of good cheer because I've overcome the world. So you and I don't have to sweat the small stuff. You and I don't have to worry about all these things that are happening because it's going to pass. All of these things that are temporal are going to pass away. We're looking towards eternity. Colossians 3.1 says, If then you were raised with Christ, 
Then seek those things which are above, where Christ is sitting at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on the things of the earth. You know, a lot of people right now, they're more concerned about their big houses and their fancy cars and their nice vacations. They're more concerned about that than they are about what's going on in the earth today. What's going on in politics. Even Christians, what's going on in our spiritual walk with the Lord. What's going on with people that are falling prey to the enemy. They're more concerned about things than they are about the eternal. You know, I don't imagine that Paul sat around worrying too much about whether or not he was going to get a new camel or a new tent or whether he was going to have something, you know, that was going to make him happy here on the earth. No, Paul was focused on eternal things. And that's where you and I need to be. We need to come to a place where we literally empty ourselves of self and let the Holy Spirit fill us. We need to put our desires our wants, our wishes. Now, God doesn't mind, uh, mind us having things, but it really is when things have us, when our focus, our sole focus is on temporary things. Folks, this world is going to come to a crashing one of these days, and all these things are not going to mean anything. Second Corinthians 4, 7. Look there with me just a minute. You know, there are things on this earth that are much, much more valuable than silver and gold, houses and cars, big vacations, lots of things. Second Corinthians 4, 7 says, But we, talking about the church, have this treasure in earthen vessels that the excellence of the power may be of God and not of us. We have. Do you know that over in the Middle East, they used to take clay pots to hide their valuables. Anything that was their riches, their jewels, their, their coins, those things that were valuable to them, they would hide them in earthen vessels. Well, guys, you and I are earthen vessels. We're clay vessels. And we have a treasure hidden inside of us. He's the Holy Spirit. He dwells within us. And because He dwells within us, He empowers us. He leads us. He guides us into the truth of the Word. He brings us revelation. He comforts us. It's a very valuable treasure that you and I as born-again believers have. And you know, the Holy Spirit lives inside of all of us born-again believers. But there's much of the body of Christ that's not really filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, I believe that when the Holy Spirit comes to live inside of us, He enables us to walk that Christian walk. But then there comes a time in our life when we yield ourselves to the Holy Spirit and we say, Lord, fill me with the Spirit. Let it overflow in my life. Some people call it the baptism of the Holy Spirit. But when the Holy Spirit of God comes and He fills you to overflow, then you're able to go and minister to others. You're able to take the things that the Holy Spirit of God has shown you, and now you're able to overflow the water of the Word into somebody else's life. You know, we may be hard-pressed. We may be struggling right now. But we're not suffocated. We may be puzzled about things in our life. But we're not utterly baffled. We may be being pursued by an enemy of our soul. But we're not caught or we're not outrun. We may be struck down. But let me tell you something, guys. We're not out of the fight. As long as we don't give up. As long as we don't quit. My pastor David's favorite scripture was Micah 7, 8. Though I fall... <laughs> I shall arise. You know, <clears throat> a lot of us, we fall down. We allow the enemy to deceive us. We, we listen to his voice rather than read scripture, rather than listen to the voice of the Lord. And we fall down. Well, let me tell you something. Don't fall prey to the enemy's lies. 
don't don't believe the the mind games that the enemy plays with you. You know, so many in the body of Christ today, the enemy is messing with their mind. He's telling them, this is never going to happen. He's putting fear inside their minds. He's saying, well, you know, you've heard all these prophecies about all these things that are coming. Well, oh, I just don't think you're going to make it. Listen, let me tell you something. We're going to go through this because the Lord Jesus Christ is right there with us. And nothing is going to happen to us that he doesn't allow. The word of God says he will complete that which concerns us. And so God is going to do whatever he needs to do in our life if we will allow the Holy Spirit to move. The only way that we can be defeated, guys, is to give up. Though I fall, I shall arise. We need to let that be one of our major scriptures nowadays. You know, we need to keep our focus on Jesus. Scripture says that he's the author and he's the finisher of our faith. He begins and puts faith into us and he helps us through the process. And at the very end of our walk, he's there to finish it. He's there, the author and the finisher of our faith. Hebrews 10, 36 says, For you have need of endurance, so that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Folks, it's not how we start out. It's how we end. Many of us started out on the right foot. We started our Christian walk. I did at about age 12. Started out, boy, I mean, running after Jesus. I love Jesus. Was participating in everything with the youth and at church and was there every time the door was open. But then somewhere along the way in my early 20s, quit going to church. My husband and I worked construction and so we were just, you know, not in church. Could have been, but we chose not to be. And we didn't make the effort. And it wasn't long. We quit reading our word. We quit going to church and we began to live after the flesh and not after the spirit. We began to let the things of the world be more important to us than the word of God. And it wasn't long and we fell away from the Lord. So it's not how we start. There came a place where the Holy Spirit of God began to dwell with me and, and speak to my heart. You know, I went for probably six months of hearing the Lord tell me, Ginger, you need to get back in church. You need to come home. But I was pretty hard-headed. And I thought, oh, you know, I'm a Christian. I'm born again. I don't need all that. But I came to the realization I did need all that. I needed to be in the presence of the Lord. I needed a church fellowship. I needed to be with like believers. And so one day I made up my mind, I'm going back to church. I went back. And I'm still there. Thank you, Jesus. It's the endurance. What we start out, we may run into a few bumps along the road. We may fall away from the Lord for a period of time. But the Bible tells us very plainly, just like the prodigal son, if we'll repent, if we'll come back to the Father's house, He's going to be there waiting for us with open arms. For you have need of endurance. So that after you have done the will of God, you may receive the promise. Folks, we need to learn to be content where we are. Don't get perplexed in this process. Don't try to figure everything out. Don't try to, you know, you, you say, well, God, you told me that this was going to happen and it hadn't happened yet. Well, don't try to figure it out. Maybe the timing is not right. Maybe there's some things in your life that you need to get rid of. Maybe... God has a bigger plan than you had thought in the beginning. You know, God has a plan. You and I have got to press on. You and I have got to do all of the things that God tells us to do. Philippians 4.13 says we can do all things through Christ who gives us strength. You know, all through this process, God's building character. The whole point of our walk with God is to be imitators of God, to be conformed to his image to look like Jesus and so when you and I are conformed into the image of Christ guess what people look at us 
And they say, whoo, they've changed. I want to be like them. I see the power of God in their life. I see the calling of God on their life. If God can change them, He can change me. That's what I tell people all the time. If God can change me, He can change you. So let me encourage you today. Take the words that I've spoken today. Take them to heart. Listen to them. If you're in a place right now where you're a, you're a born-again believer, maybe you're filled with the Holy Spirit, maybe you're in church every time the doors are open, but life just seems to be falling apart right now. Listen to me. If you'll be obedient to the Lord, if you'll do what God says do, God will change your situations. Now, He's not going to make the people around you do anything. They have to make a choice to do that. But you know, I have found in my life that a lot of times God's working on me. He's more important in me getting fixed, and then He'll worry about these other folks. Really and truly what's happening is, is that He's doing a work in you, and He's wanting you to make some changes, and then He'll work on that other person. It's not our job to change anybody. Our job is to allow the Holy Spirit of God to change us. So I encourage you today, let's grow up in the Lord. Let's not get perplexed or confused or bewildered over all the things that take place in our Christian walk. Let's just trust the Lord. Let's just look into the Word of God and take that Word and apply it to our life on a daily basis and say, Lord, I may not be where I need to be today, but I'm pressing forward. I'm not going to give up. I'm not going to quit. And when I fall down, I'm going to get back up again because that's the only way that the enemy can defeat you. So I encourage you today, make the move with me and let's continue to read the Word of God, continue to, to renew our mind, continue to find out who we are in the Lord Jesus Christ and then use that information and apply it to our life and be the very best that we can be for Jesus. He's coming soon and we want to be ready. So I encourage you today, have a good day, make that move and I'll see you next time.